song on the book, in front. It fits in with our theme of trust and guidance and following guidance, letting the Holy Spirit guide you. In fact, Gershon said, this is such a good song, we should play it every day. So I said, well, this is a good day to start. With. So, yeah, we might just read through the lyrics together, and then um, I'm just going to press play, and you can hear uh, how Scott and Donna sound. This is the chorus. Yeah, this is the chorus. So we'll just read through it together, and then I'll press play, and you can just hear the music and join in with it. And then when we get really confident, and we all get our beautiful singing voices in here, we won't need their just before we go into the song, is this question here? Answer time now? Or right after the song. Right after the song.
maybe we'll, <coughs> just so we don't lose these, we'll, we'll leave them all in the room here. Um, so when we leave the room, perhaps we'll just pop them all on the little table with the altar there, so we know where they are. Yes, that's really beautiful. 
Because it is uh, a letting go of all preconceived notions. In fact, um, in the rules for decision section, it's in the text, he actually says that your one remaining problem uh, is that you uh, decide what you want, and then you ask. Uh, you have it in that order. Uh, so you can see where the whole curriculum is designed to have you ask first, and then join with that guidance, and then make your decisions from that joining. So you might say a prayer it would be like, Holy Spirit, decide for God for me. Or like you're in a sense of partnership with your higher self, or in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and in that same section it says basically that you're always deciding either for God or against God. In other words, there's not other options. You can't say, oh I'm fed up with you, ego and Holy Spirit, both of you, go to your corners. <laughs> I'm not going to, today I'm not going to listen to either of you. Uh, I'm fed up, I'm too, no, it doesn't work that way. It's like either or. You're always deciding for one or the other. So, uh, what you were mentioning was from the, the stages of the development of trust. And basically last night I started going through some of those, uh, basically talking about the first stage, which is, uh, you know, a period of undoing, and then a period of relinquishment, and then a period of sorting out, you know, those are just the first three. And so you can tell from the sound of all those three that it's very much letting go. As you open up to the curriculum, that all of the education and everything we've learned from little child all the way up to adulthood has been a curriculum in judgment. We're taught how to judge, how to make wise judgments, you know, the judgments are based usually on a curriculum that, that we could say is set up by the world for to uh, be safe, to be sound, to be autonomous, to grow into a fully functioning adult citizen and learn what good judgment is, to learn what maturity is, to advance, to be a mature functioning adult. And then we can say that the Holy Spirit's curriculum is, is undoing all of that. So that you become guided, moment by moment. Not that you become obsessive, that you, you know, have to say with every single decision that you make during the day, what do you want me to do, what do you want me to do, uh, make it obsessive like that, but you, you start to develop such a trust in going with the flow that it's like that, that general sense of trust and flow just seems to uh, govern your decisions. So you're like in a flow of continuous decisions. Just like if you were learning to ride a bike, you know, at first, you know, you may go through it in more of a methodical way of, of learning to balance and with the pedals and learning to steer and so forth. Or let's say you're learning a game of golf or tennis. Uh, you know, you've, you've learned things such as backswing and follow through and techniques and mechanics. But then, when you get so good at it, you can just ride the bike, take the golf swing, take the tennis swing, without it being like a step-by-step -step thing, just like a beautiful flow. Hi! <laughs> totally connected. <laughs> but guided to go on to something more fun. <laughs> See how it's highly individualized. <laughs> so, uh, so that's exactly the way it works. And then you, you basically learn that you, in any situation that you seem to find yourself, you learn that you cannot prejudge the situation. And that's basically how the ego operates. I mean, that's how you function to be safe and secure and to have a sense of, of control and well-being is to know your situations. Know what you're getting into. We had parents that would always say, you know, be careful. Do you know what you're getting into uh, when you join this group or when you date this person or whatever, you know, when you go to mom and dad and say, I'm going to get married. It's like they say, well, you know, you're, you're marrying more than just this one person. We're marrying into a whole family. Have you met the in-laws yet? You know, you know, do you know the consequences? The whole curriculum in judgment is to, to prejudge and to have safety and security through prejudging. 
And this is very much like going completely the other direction where, I mean, I, I remember, for me, I was working with the Course and I remember in a practical way, I would just, every time I would cross through a doorway or through a threshold or whatever, I would repeat internally that prayer uh, at the beginning of the book. I think it was 24 on the first edition, 28 on the second edition. It was, I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent Him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do, for He who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever He wishes, knowing He goes there with me, and I will be healed as I let Him teach me to heal. So that prayer would just kind of flow through me. I go to the grocery store, the laundry mat, the Course in Miracles group, I mean, to visit my grandmother. Every time before I would go through the doorway, I would just silently reorient my mind into clear, clear, uh, I really don't know why I'm here, except I'm here to be truly helpful, and then I would click my mind into that. And I would have these miraculous experiences everywhere I went, because I was in that state of, you show me, you guide me, you go before me and lead the way. And it makes you very humble uh, when you, it really undoes the self-concept in a hurry. I'm not saying that they actually believe someone knows something that they actually don't pay mm -hmm. attention, which is what they pay attention to, which is what they're showing control. Yeah, you could say that, that what you're clearing away is you're clearing away all ego goals and judgments and agendas. And where do these goals and judgments and agendas come from except the self-concept? You know, if you believe you're a person, you have these ambitions, these kind of interests, these things, projects that you're pursuing, and so forth, then it's easy to get into frustration because there's a lot of expectations that are tied into those goals and agendas. And when the script doesn't meet perfectly with those goals and agendas, there's obviously going to be irritation, being annoyed, all the way down to anger or rage. Uh, almost like a child has a temper tantrum when they don't get what they want. It works, the same dynamics work all the way through adulthood. When you have something in mind and you really have your heart set on it, an outcome in mind, and then you don't get that outcome, it's not that the, uh, the universe or God or spirit are conspiring against you to, to give you a bad day, to give you a lousy day. It's that it's another step in undoing this ego, make-believe self-concept that was made to take the place of your true self, your higher self, your Christ self. So it starts to make sense from that kind of a context. But the ego is never happy with all that. It, it wants to conclude something's gone wrong. Uh, and when you follow the Spirit, you, you learn to be very flexible. On uh, this trip, I was sharing the story at one of our gatherings that uh, we went down to Bellington to check out this house that was possibly going to be donated as a peace house and, and so forth. And uh, we were meeting with a woman who was going to be donating the house and she had a Down Syndrome teenager uh, who she said was going through phases of rebellion and uh, asserting her independence and authority. But we were going to have a meeting, but the meeting, uh, the woman who was there hosting us really couldn't give her a full attention to even a meeting to discuss things with the child right there. And she would go over and the child, you know, Lisa was laying there uh, naked out on the back porch and, and her mother Rita was trying to get her clothes on, first the underpants. And she'd take the underpants over and Rita would bat them, They'd go flying through the air, like, no, I'm not being dressed. And it was kind of this thing where Rita said, she's just in this thing with me now. And I know if I had some help here, it really would would help out, and I think she, she looked around, I think she looked at Annie, Annie was like... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's too much right. it. <laughs> The hands just went up, it was very clear. I'm not clear enough. The hands out, now my hands are not going into that one. And then Jason stepped forward and said, jumped right up, went over there with, with the underpants, with the pants, with the blouse, and within 50 seconds, this teenage uh, Down syndrome girl was completely dressed from head to toe, and, and very happy. <laughs> uh, just, and Jason went over there with, 
but, and, and again, it was like, was it a, a special gift, a special skill, or whatever? No, Jason was, again, following the prompts of the Holy Spirit of what would be most helpful for us, the best use of time. And, of course, this, for Rita, her stress came right down when she saw how, how easy that was. And then Jason was very helpful during the day, was able to help her, let her go out, bring her back to the van. One time she didn't want to, she was watching everybody uh, at a swimming place and, and she didn't want to go back in the van so Jason just carefully picked her up like a sack of potatoes <laughs> and brought her right back over. Very in the flow of spirit, but again that's what we mean by be flexible. You know, it has to be practical and to serve everyone. And there's a sense of joy. There was definitely a sense of joy and, and happiness with, with all of it. And, and that's how you know that it's the spirit, when it feels like it's very practical and joyful. And you feel lighthearted, then you know that the spirit is just gently orchestrating the whole thing. Can I just say that the reason I'm here is because 12 months ago in the Way of the Heart journal, a saying that you had, in one of your articles, was so powerful, and I put it in front of me on um, where I had my breakfast in the kitchen, and it was awakening in love equals giving divinity and taking nothing personally. And that was such a powerful thing, so that it's, it's been a, a, a salvation or a, a help in various you know, things, that taking nothing personally. It's so easy to do when you, you assume that blame automatically when it's not yours anyway. But that was so, so powerful. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, just on this whole thing of trust, before I came up here I went to a, um, a insurance broker who's actually a friend of mine and he's, he's just done this for the last 15, 20 years. He sells life insurance and write it down because I can't quite remember it. Trauma, total disability, business expenses. So anyway, I've got this quote done from him and it's quite expensive to, to get all this insurance. But the way he went about setting up um, what he thought my needs were, as a look at all my debts, and the debts and possibly a few debts, <coughs> and we've got all the options, but I sort of went on the lower scale of things, so that if I happen to um, get injured on a job or something like that, or break both legs, I've got my income, it basically covers me for virtually anything that could go wrong, and this is how he's set it up. Okay, and they kind of gauge that, they say, well, what sort of insurance do you want? Do you want to just go really budget, high risk, or are you more on the cautious side? I'm more on the cautious side. But all along I was thinking, I was sort of relating it back to um, course, and I was thinking, what what mind am I in when I'm making this decision? This decision? Like, um, there's fear, there's obviously, like, there's a fear of the minute if I get injured, then how can I pay the mortgage for the or if I die, I don't want to burden my parents with a debt. So um, I was just, I had a discussion with David briefly about it yesterday and um, I'm still a little bit confused, like if there's, um, to me, um, I sort of see it, yeah, there's a bit of a fear thing there and that would bring um, a certain peace of mind and that's almost just like formality. Would you see that as, as as being, uh, being um, going, going to the view of the ego. How would you see that? Well, the Holy Spirit knows that the mind believes in the ego and, and has set up a fear-based world based on that belief system. And so the Holy Spirit is not going to like yank the tablecloth out. Uh, you know, like, like setting your table with the the silverware, the dishes, and the glasses, and everything, and doing one of these kind of magician things where it's just like, it's just ripped the whole thing out. I mean, if it was a highly trained magician, and you and really had done it many times, and you'd seen it many times, you may say, okay, we'll go for the, the quick pull. But generally speaking, people are given a slowly evolving curriculum where uh, pockets of guilt and, and grievances and fears are are addressed in a progressive way. Uh, just like if you were working with a child, uh, you, could, you couldn't go for 
major kind of obstacles in learning. You have, to, you have to build a sense of trust and confidence. And so, the Holy Spirit can really use anything. Um, I've had, I had a woman who wanted to travel with me, and uh, she had told me from the very beginning, when I went to her house, she said, I smoke. And she looked at me and she said, do you have a problem with that? And I said, oh, I don't have a problem with anything. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, you know, well, can I smoke? And I said, well, it's your house. I mean, it's like you're asking me if you can smoke in your own house. She had asked me, you know, what's my favorite meal? I want to cook you your favorite meal. I said, I really don't have a favorite meal. What's your favorite meal? Let's have, like, prime rib. So we had prime rib. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. It's very light, very gentle. You're not trying to pull anything away from anyone. And really, the Holy Spirit's not trying to, like, pull anything away from you just show you a different interpretation, just show you there's another way of looking at something and then the fear, the grip can loosen a bit. So uh, the woman uh, traveled with me, it was Lisa, and, and she basically had her cigarettes and you know, generally when I'm going to restaurants and in places and everything, generally I've been in like non-smoking areas, <coughs> oh, I was in the smoking areas over and over and over. <laughs> uh, the people we met along the trip was a very high proportion of smokers. They were just drawn to her, and she was, I was like, wow, the Holy Spirit really used the cigarettes. <laughs> we, don't, we don't think of the Holy Spirit using cigarettes uh, as a symbol of awakening, but actually, the whole trip was orchestrated. She'd go out, light up the cigarette, and she'd have like a whole group out there. <laughs> she'd have gatherings going outside the gathering, talking about the Spirit. So, it's the same with insurance. Um, it's again, the, the whole point of, of guidance is to help you reduce the fear and undo the ego. Whereas ego defense mechanisms are often, they are designed to minimize the fear, but to keep the, the fear intact. So you see the difference between guidance. Guidance is to minimize the fear and release the fear. The ego wants to minimize the fear and keep the fear. Because the ego needs the fear to maintain its, its sense of identity. So, like with insurance, it's, it's really, really highly individual. <coughs> when I was guided by Jesus to, you know, as he said in the Bible, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God, I took that to mean that I was not to overtly try and go and break the laws of this world. You know, if, if there was like, you're living in a, in a particular country, or city or county and they have, let's say, like liability insurance that's required for to drive an automobile, to get a licensed automobile and to drive it. I wasn't to go against that. I was actually to go ahead and, and get the liability insurance. If I was going along and there was a, a, a hermitage or a property where it was necessary to have a mortgage, if you have a mortgage on a property, then the mortgage company requires that you have insurance. So again, it was required. Uh, there were times in my life when I would have a property or, uh, and it was paid off and there was really no need uh, to have insurance on it uh, unless the guidance would come in. And with our Peace House, to give you an example with insurance, uh, we had a, a pretty long stretch there where it was, it was paid off, there was no insurance on it whatsoever, and uh, it definitely, uh, a tree blasted into it one time uh, during a windstorm. It looked like a, a cannonball from the old pirate ship days. It blasted right into the side of the house, which uh, my friend Jeffrey was there. He went and repaired that. Um, we had, at one point, we had a huge dead tree in the neighbor's yard. Uh, it was a massive tree, and it was no longer growing, so to speak. And, and so we had an interesting discussion about uh, talking with the neighbor about taking the tree down and so on and so forth, and the neighbor wasn't really interested. I mean, it just seemingly this tree was so massive that if the tree had, had fallen over on the house, it would have literally crushed the entire house. <laughs> the peace house wasn't so large. And so we had discussions at one point and uh, just asked the Holy Spirit, you know, what do you want us to do in a practical way? The neighbor doesn't want to seem to take the tree down. It's really on the neighbor's property. And you can't force somebody into doing anything. And the Holy Spirit said, you know, to get insurance. Uh, so we just listened and followed. So it, it gets away from kind of 
set things as saying this is good, this is bad, as if yeah. we can tie it in to the ego. And, and, and you know, it's the same with uh, medical insurance and insurance payments that come uh, via uh, the government or something like that. Uh, when Kirsten first came over, part of her spiritual awakening was she had had two major head injuries. Uh, one, a mountain, flying off a mountain bike, uh, and another one flying off some skis. And she went from almost type A and really go, go, go. That really slowed her down. It's like getting a spiritual two by four twice. <laughs> and so when she came over, first came over uh, to be with me and to study and to really immerse and help out at the Peace House, uh, she was receiving disability uh, from New Zealand, from uh, the government and so forth. And as she worked and cleared her mind and med became able to meditate more and be seen to get her energy back and didn't have to take uh, afternoon naps and so forth, uh, she just got to the point where it was like she still was receiving the disability <laughs> payments, but then it got to a point of integrity, uh, you know, where you can feel it inside, you know, where it's, it has served. And so we would have discussions and I would say, well, you have to see that the money is not really coming from the government, it's just the way that the Holy Spirit is providing for you at this point. And then when it gets to be a point when you feel you need to take action on it intuitively, then you should take action. So she ended up contacting her counselor and saying, actually I'm feeling much more energy now and this and this and, and I really don't know that I really need to be receiving. Uh, the disability anymore, and he said, oh no, keep receiving it, go ahead. <laughs> and so she was like, okay. Uh, you know, I felt it, I made the attempt. <laughs> you can just keep giving me money, that's all right, I'll go along with my minute. If you can see where well, you just have to be intuitive with it. And if you feel any kind of sense of question or guilt about something, then it's good to take a look. And be very open with the Spirit about that. Just say to the Holy Spirit, what would you have me do? I'm feeling a little anxious or a little bit guilt around something. Uh, would you like me to take action? So it, it brings it back to really following how you feel and being honest with yourself, as opposed to any kind of set way of this is of the ego, this yeah, is of the Spirit. I guess I was just looking at it Instead of feeling like a pressure of, I have to do this, or I have to do that. The shoulds, the ought tos, the have tos, the I must, you know, it puts a lot of stress and pressure on the mind when it gets locked into those kind of things. And, and uh, 
it really is uh, being intuitive. I mean, even when, nowadays when you go to buy any kind of a major appliance, anything from a car to a washing machine, dryer, you know, a lot of electronic appliances, computers, um, it also depends, like, you know, if you use it seemingly just for yourself or if you had a business and you were using computers, uh, a lot of high-tech equipment that had an enormous amount of use was happening. Uh, there have been times when, um, whether it's been a computer or a, a camera or something that's very high-tech, um, where they will say, would you like the optional, beyond the manufacturer's warranty, would you like to add some, something like that? And if you ended up, if it's part of what you do, like, uh, for example, we, we use computers, we communicate with people all over the world, um, have wireless and high-speed access and, and use that a lot. We're just heavy based on communications. Because uh, the Holy Spirit uses the body and the technology for communication. That's, that's a, a very common thing that the Holy Spirit uses the things of this world for. In fact, uh, it even says in the Course in Miracles that the only function of the body is, is solely as a communication device. And you can think of all the ways in which the body is used. The ego can use it for competition, pride, uh, building an image, you know, there's many things that the ego can use it for, but, but really the only use that it truly has is for as a communication device. And if it's used as a communication device, it frees the mind of guilt, because that's the whole purpose. And then without the guilt, then the body doesn't seem to get sick or break down in the sense of, because it's being used for a, a purpose in alignment with divinity. And so that's important to realize as well. So it, it is highly individual, but, but even whether it's, uh, like you're talking about losing employment, um, uh, or it could be something like for an appliance, or health insurance, life insurance, you know, there's many different things that come up, and, and it really comes down to guidance. Um, there have been people that have been laid off, or have gone through kind of injuries and experiences like that, and and they have been provided for through insurance, but again, it's, it's seen as divine providence. It's like the Holy Spirit is always watching over you, no matter what you seem to do, no matter what road you take. It's really all divine providence. It's only when you have these ego filters and say, well, I earned the money, not the Holy Spirit. Uh, I paid the premium. Uh, I, I saved that money in the bank account, and I provided for myself. You can try to fool yourself into this context that you personally are providing for yourself. But there's still a lot of stress for that. I mean, it takes a lot of work to be a provider for a body or to have children, take responsibility for them too. It can, the mind can work itself into a lot of stress when actually divine providence is just always there. It can either be recognized or not recognized. So that's really what uh, it comes down, and like Lynn was saying, it can be very unconventional. You never know how it can be provided for. I found in my life as I went along, you know, that things were provided in many ways. I mean, not like I felt like I had to have a membership with the AAA automobile club, but when somebody offers you, like your biological father, and says, I'm buying you as a gift, uh, AAA coverage, uh, and then you take it, and lo and behold, the car breaks down or something, and you have all these holy encounters uh, with the people with the, that come to put gas in your car or to tow it or to do something. It's just all wonderful encounters. You don't have to see it as uh, providing for yourself. You just have to be very open and not prejudge uh, the ways that you are provided for. And that was the biggest problem for me at the beginning when I started to really trust was I was so used to providing for myself through all those years of education and, and working jobs and having benefits and, and doing going that route that even when I started to loosen from that stuff and people would say, do you need a ride? Can I offer you some food or some money or a place to stay or whatever? Initially, when I was just going out on the road, I found myself a lot of times saying, oh, no, I couldn't take that. No, no, I, I couldn't possibly take that from you, and this and this and this, and this went on for a period of weeks and months, 
Until finally Jesus spoke to me again and said, Would you stop that? I am trying to provide for you and help you out in this new way that you're going and you're refusing. You know, like the story about the guy who's drowning and God sends the boat and the helicopter and everything. You know, it's, it's very much like that, that when you start to really trust in divine providence, then you have to be gracious and just accept what is given you. You also get this sense that all things work together for good, so you're just enjoying the holy encounters. Um, all of us have had the experience where, like you go into a restaurant or a fast food place or something, and, and um, sometimes the, the person who's at the counter may uh, make a mistake seemingly with the, at the cash register, where they, they take too much of your money or they give you back uh, too much money. And it's easy to get into guilt. Mm -hmm. about walking off and you're going and then you're, you're 20 minutes later you are you I've got too much money or they took my money they took my money and didn't give me the proper change the more you get into the flow you start to realize it's just about blessing everyone and trusting that that it all evens out you know that all things work together for good and you don't you know have to run back and file a report and go through all this stuff you can just go oh okay uh, and you move with the flow, and and once you get more trusting, then you just start to say, it's perfect. It's all perfect. Hi. I'm in a, a job which I don't really like that much. Um, <laughs> was it like that movie last night? <laughs> Like I mentioned about the stages of the development of trust, you know, the first three were, you know, undoing and then period of relinquishment where it seems as if things are being taken away from you and then a period of sorting out. So oftentimes you really have to watch what the emotions are. I mean, I, I know that after I started working with A Course in Miracles, um, the kinds of jobs that I was guided to apply for and to take were not something that David would have chosen. Um, it was, they were strikingly uh, different. Uh, I would say they were definitely, they were well selected for undoing <laughs> and relinquishment uh, because so many things were coming at me so fast. Uh, I would say from a world's perspective they would even be called high stress jobs uh, at the beginning. And the reason they were so stressful is because the ego had all this pride. It's almost like there was a chip on the shoulder uh, that the spirit had to knock off uh, before I could be used in more helpful ways, you know, for the spirit. So that's why it's really looking and getting more and more in touch with a sense of guidance, you know. The only way I could even begin to comprehend why the spirit would guide me into those kind of job situations was for the clearing away of pride. And that's what I was told. 
uh, at the beginning. It's like, oh, this is exactly what it's about. And, uh, and there was a lot of pride rearing up, and I deserve better than this, and why am I wasting my time with this, or this is a waste of my skills, and so forth. And the Spirit's like, oh, you've got a lot of judgments that are clouding the way. You can't be used as a miracle worker uh, with all those judgments in there. You have to clear it away. So it was more like a purge. It felt like uh, at one point I had an eight-month job as a case manager where I was working with uh, clients that were had seemingly physical ailments like hearing deficits, uh, deaf, or blind, uh, schizophrenia, psychosis, mental retardation, and a mix of all clients that I was working with. And uh, I remember it was very highly stressful. I was working with Course in Miracles. I was doing all the mind training, but I would say, you know, to the Holy Spirit, you know, I've been in university for ten years. You know, is this what is the purpose of all this? And again, it was the undoing of pride. And I was told from the Spirit, you need to learn how to pray. Uh, that they hadn't in ten years of university, I had not been taught uh, how to pray. And when you're in when you're in the church growing up, you know, you know, a prayer is just something that you can be a very much like rote from memory, you know. You sit at the dinner table, God is great, God is good, and we thank him for our food. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's the Holy Spirit is like, that's not exactly uh, the depths of, of prayer, where this is leading. And so, really what was, was learn to ask for help. You know, when I would have somebody who would come in, for an intake, a client, uh, of course the ego had wanted to prejudge and read all the files and, and put them into a category and diagnose and treat in all of its ways. And then the Holy Spirit was like, no, you're supposed to see them as if for the very first time. Put away all those reports, the files. Don't even look at anything from their history. Uh, learn how to open up and, and listen and follow uh, and be guided in that intake interview and learn how to pray. So that was a, a big part of the, the thing, learning to ask for help and to follow that intuitive guidance. And when I did, the stresses disappeared and everything turned out very joyful. When I tried to take all those that past learning from ten years of university to apply it, almost to diagnose and to be the healer uh, based on what I knew, you know, that would never work. It, would, it stayed high stress. So, I think that's kind of a context to keep in mind. Yeah. You may not like the job, but, but it may be helpful in the sense of helping you release and relinquish some aspects uh, of things that need to get cleared away for you to then get deeper into your calling, you know, to kind of clear away the, the obstacles. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having everyone out the door now. <laughs> so, thank you very much for this morning's session. <laughs> thank you, David. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Tomorrow, um, you're not wearing a watch again. Okay? A what? You just got by the spirit. You're not wearing a watch. Oh my God! Right, you can come back another time. I hope um, I hope you enjoyed that experience first thing this morning. The, uh, the feet washing. I have to say, from somebody who was actually doing the washing, or being there, and providing that energy, I thought I was I thought I was getting the best deal by receiving in the process. It was the most exquisite experience. Now I know why Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. It wasn't actually for their benefit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not, but anyway, it was certainly a beautiful blessing for those of us that gave it some. I know most of you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.